2020 uh, meeting of the plan the city of Rehoboth Planning Commission will come to order. Um, welcome to everyone in the new year. Uh, I think we'll get off and running pretty quickly. Um, would the secretary please call the roll? Sure. Uh, Mr. Franzo? Here. Mr. Covington? Here. Mr. Hunker? Looks like he's not here. Ms. Matcha? Here. Andrew Steele? Here. Mr. Swain? Here. And Mr. Kaufman? Here. And Mr. Perry? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, and do you have the verification of meeting notice? The agenda was posted at City Hall and on the city portal at on January 3rd and also sent out from the portal to subscribers and voters. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no minutes, correct, at this point. And did we receive any correspondence? No. no. Um, there's no old business or new business, so we'll move into other business. Um, where did Debbie go? Oh, <laughs> I thought you left the room. Uh, Debbie, uh, you want to uh, launch things off uh, in the new year here on the uh, CDP? Yes. So we did thank you for the input from the last Planning Commission meeting. Um, there was a lot of dialogue, and we, got, um, we received a lot of information from the Planning Commission. I think everybody did their homework really well in trying to capture topics. So what we did was have the list from the last meeting we verbally discussed, and we went through the feedback from the planning commissioners, and what I did was try to lump it in topic workshops. Not the easiest task, but I think you'll be happy with what we have tonight, and we're looking for additional input. So with that, what we'd like to do is talk about our focused outreach workshop program, and that's what we'd like to um, talk about tonight, today, get some input, and then have you sleep on it and provide additional input back to your planning commission chair. Um, so what we have have come up with, which we'll go into a little bit deeper, is right now potentially five focused workshops. We were looking at the approach of the open house environment that's friendly and welcoming, so we can have one-on-one -on -one dialogue and a comfortable setting uh, with all the similar hours and predetermined dates. So for this to be successful, we need to get the information out ahead of time, make sure everybody knows the times, what we're doing, and where we're doing them. We'd like to be able to do one promotional flyer for all the workshops, so we do not have to do massive production or hound people too much in, as they start their busier season. So one flyer for all the workshops, very organized. Um, another uh, approach we'd like to talk about is table education, exhibit, and input stations. So if you think if you've been to an event and uh, pretty much like an exhibit hall, where if you're interested in the topic, there'll be educational information, resources, somebody manning the booth or the table to be able to help you for your interested topic. We usually learn at least one or two things at each booth as we go through with that. And then also um, obtaining speakers of specific subject matter. So while we can have this open house exhibit setting, we can have a poster agenda that can say at two o'clock today, we are gonna have this person speak about this specific topic if you wanted to stick uh, to stay and have that. And they'd be shorter. We're not talking about two hours or four hours or lectures. We want it to be at the audience level to be able to have them understand, give them some tidbits to be able to get more information. And then for this to be successful, we just do not need to throw another workshop for the heck of it. There's a lot of workshops in Rehoboth, a lot of committee meetings, a lot of um, commission meetings, planning commission meetings. So we'd like to have it with an organized set of goals and strategies and what are some of the anticipated outcomes that we can have in this? Not to speak for everybody, but what do we want out of this? We actually want more information. And I think the Planning Commission is going to learn a lot about what's going on in Rehoboth because every time I listen to minutes or obtain a document, I learn a lot from it. So I think it'll be a great information portal for everybody. So once again, we're going to give this document to you and have some input and dialogue. I just wanted to give a quick overview we did talk to the city about the Rehoboth Beach Convention Center. It is um, ideal based for its location and size. It can accommodate a large crowd. When you do an open house, old school is called charrette. Uh, when you do these type of settings, sometimes you don't know if you have five people or 500. It depends on the topic. If you're raising utilities, 500. If you're talking about a subject of um, maybe 
I'm not going to say far either, but a subject that's probably less um, draw for the crowd, you may have five people. It's the same amount of resources. It's the same amount of outreach that has to take place, so let's make them effective. So we think it's great for multiple displays, an open house workshop. Um, the schedule we have of the Rehoboth Beach Convention Center is we're looking at the schedule of Saturdays with a backup of Sunday if we need to. They have a small window of a couple Saturdays being available, and we wanted input from the Planning Commission. If we have workshops on Wednesday, will we get the majority of the crowd that's available? We talked about Monday, would that work? Um, so Saturday was one of the targeted dates preferred, if we can get the facility, with a backup potentially of Sunday, knowing that a lot of people may leave in the afternoon or evening, so we may want to capture a morning uh, um, scheduled event. Right now, the schedule looking at is mid-March, the 21st through April 5th timeframe. So we want you to just tentatively, um, before we ask for the volunteers on the workshop <laughs> leader, just to think about those days in mind right now. We have not committed without your input. We have not asked for these dates. They might not even be available starting tomorrow. That is a hot location. And we thought that split days would also be good. If we have five topic dates, maybe we can do something in the morning as a topic with a, a leader. Maybe we could do a different topic in the afternoon. People might want to stay all day. They might want to stay for half a day. But if they're organized, we're going to be able to get input and focused um, information from everybody in those settings. That's right now what we've just maybe thought about presenting to you without having lead meetings with the leaders, because we know that we're asking for some responsibility. We do have another facility we may be able to get besides the convention center, but we would have to work on locking down the days first. So we're still working on that just a little bit. But it'd be great to have a flyer to say we have these three Saturdays in a row or every other Saturday and this part of a Sunday, and it's on the flyer and everybody knows where to go, when to come, what the topic is of their interest. Like I said, some topics some people might not be interested in, others they might. So with that is just an overview. We're going to give you an example of one in a minute. We do have a job description. We didn't put number 10, other duties assigned necessary that you probably all have seen before in a real job description. <laughs> but we're looking for two meetings for organization. So out of these five topics, we're going to look for workshop leaders to be able to take on a, a prevalent role and a prevalent lead of that topic. We look for one internal kickoff meeting, which would be the staff, the planning commission chair, the vice chair, and the consultant. So we would work with Sharon to see what existing resources she would have that could be able to accommodate this, what they have on their plate. And you're not alone. So you will not be a lead of something and licking um, envelopes or stamps in the middle of the night. So we, we have a team, but we would like to have a local leader. The second meeting is we'd like to take the ideas that you've obtained from other planning commission members, the community and do a final coordination of what tasks have to be done. So if you think about this, you're hosting a large party. And we want it to be fun, believe it or not. So you're the host of a large party, and you have a team to help you set everything up. Um, and you'd be the primary point, point of contact for the workshops. You'd also provide input uh, for the workshop partners and content. And then you'd also have input on the say of the templates, the posters, the event layout, et cetera. So we can have some standardization for, for the branding of the, um, of the workshops. We'd like the leader position to be available for a workshop for setup, the event itself, and the teardown. But what we wanted to do is be very clear in saying we would like all the commissioners to attend all of the workshops and assist and have dialogue and hand stations with all the topics. Because you will be the leaders of the document. You probably want to hear what everybody has to say in different events, if you're available. We know that that's a lot of commitment, um, and it's going to be a lot of Saturdays. But if we could have the leaders at least be accountable for one workshop, every leader can report back of what they found and what the findings were. And then the promotional lead for the event. We're not going to have you go door to door and sell some kind of spices with your, <laughs> um, with your event um, flyer. The city has a great public information officer in process for outreach. But there's social media. So when we did this survey, the planning commission members did a great job on social media, going to their neighbors, to their communities, homeowners association, neighbors. So we want that person to be the lead to say, help me help make this a successful event. And then provide output. 
Um, so we can discuss how we want the output to come when you come back to the committee. How did it work? How was your event? What are lessons learned? So we can have a template, or we do feel that this planning commission has been great in verbal dialogue. We've had some really good discussions. So to discuss the workshop that held and have everybody's input on it, and for us to catalog the results might be the easiest way. And then uh, coordinate with relevant city committees and organizations. This is important. We have a lot of committees in the city of Rehoboth doing a lot of good work. And sometimes they're, they're not aware of the, uh, what the other one's doing or how they can overlap or how they can affect um, or how they can help each other. So we thought this is a great way for the workshop leaders on their topic to be able to work with other committees and bring them in as well and have them do a station and a table and talk about their initiatives. They actually might be a lot more knowledgeable for years of service in that topic as you're talking about all services and all topics. Some of the committees are focused on specific things. So are there questions on that before I kind of run through an example? Is that about Rick and Jeff where we were talking on that was quick? It's probably going to be easier to understand if I go through one. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that was, that was a very good presentation. Uh, you know, I, I look at these workshops as not only an opportunity for us to obtain more input for our consideration in developing the CDP, um, <clears throat> but uh, also an educational opportunity for people in the community to have a better understanding of what the city you know, is doing, has done, uh, and what their plans are uh, so that they have uh, uh, more information to, to make uh, decisions uh, and provide us with, with real relevant input. I, I mentioned to, uh, to Jeff and, and to uh, Debbie, and we were talking that one of the questions I'd like to ask people at the at these workshops is now that you have had an opportunity to gather more information and learn some more about this topic area, if you had filled out, if you were someone who filled out the survey, would you change any of your comments um, based on the information you've learned here today? Uh, and I think it would be interesting to know that um, as, as one aspect of our learning process here. Can I just ask you one question? Yes. Um, at the beginning, I think you said there'd be five workshops, is that right? Yes. So are you planning more than one on a given day? Yes, but we're trying, to, if we can, because we know that the resources of the Planning Commission, that's going to be given up months of your Saturdays, and mine too, <laughs> if I'm being selfish. But if there's topics that can be driven in a four-hour window, Okay. And then to transfer over into another four hour window. Okay. That's about a time span for the public and for volunteers versus an eight hour day. Sometimes you lose people in that. So you it's could less do focused. it in two days. Correct. So if okay. we had five topics, we'd be two and a half days, depending on how tight the topics were or the content once we kind of drill down a little bit more. Okay. Some of them are probably going to be more intense than others. In your experience, is four hours the right amount of time? That seems like a lot also. Exact, so not four hours of speaking, so four hours of a trade show, meaning the people that get their coffee that are walking around town can pop in and walk around and see the tables. Maybe they're not interested in a speaker. Some people maybe have done enough research or really are passionate or strong about that topic and want to listen to the speaker, or they want to be there all day. If we have eight hours, it's hard to figure out, are we just going to do the hot topics and everything else gets under the rug? So four hours, is, is it, if it's organized and focused, it's effective or it's eight hours of let's see what people want, which I think four hours, of, if we get it organized and focused, I think it'll be very effective. So with that, one of, I would like to walk you through, if you were the leader, to pick one of the topics. One topic we threw out, and these are not set in stone. This is where we want the input that we're gonna rely on our leaders of the workshop to work with the committee members and the public to see how we can make this better with the local knowledge. So one topic we came up with was connectivity. So when you think of connectivity, and I start pulling words, and we start putting it into the shapes, there's a lot of different things. So the intent of our workshop, which you're going to see these on almost every page, is we want it focused and well-promoted. Without the focused and well-promoted approach, this will not be effective. It's another event that somebody comes to, and what's the draw? Why do they want to come? Why do they care? Um, so we want it focused and well-promoted. Collaborative effort with multiple partners. Rehoboth has so many good partners. So does the county. So does the state. 
you have a lot of federal employees. So you have a federal system as well. So if we can tap into these focused multiple partners, and then we'll, they're willing to give up some of their time or do some of the pro bono time or set up a table and help us with education, you already have those resources that have been tapped and it would be great to be able to use for the community this time. Um, the third one is educate. So one thing I learned something every single time I come to Rehoboth. When people say this is not being done, the first thing I do is get on the website and it's, it's underway or it's gonna happen. So you have a great resource of the website. Everything's at your fingertips nowadays. If people don't know about it, it's not because it hasn't been published, it hasn't been open government, it hasn't been recorded, it hasn't been live. It's because maybe that just didn't pique their interest and maybe they need a setting where we just talk one-on-one, -on -one, which is still a lot of people's comfort level. So if we can show some safety um, for connectivity, some statistics relating to connectivity, programs, justification and some standards, why do people have to do it this way? Why do we have to have crosswalks like this? Why do bus, uh, what's the standards for a bus stop? And how many parking spaces are we removed for that? If there's some education by some of those partners, that would help that out a lot. You can't blame everything on the commission, the council, the city, the employees. Sometimes it's out of their hands. And sometimes there's good things happening that people just don't know about. So let's help get that information promoted. Let's actually brag a little too. So promoting, this is big. What are the existing initiatives? What are some of the future initiatives that you might not even know about that are starting the budget process? What are some new programs that are being instilled? We always read about the bad things. Everybody likes to still read about. What about some of the good things that are happening? This is a great venue to show, and how can we preserve and protect those for the future of the next 10 years? And then obtaining input. Where are the areas of improvement? What are some of the new ideas where you've lived, worked, traveled, played, that you can bring back that we can try to incorporate into our comprehensive plan? Or you might research or actually entertain. So traveling always gives you new ideas. So some of the categories within this connectivity umbrella workshop could be bicycle, public transportation, pedestrian, vehicle, signage, and accessibility. So underneath these categories could be several subcategories. So under bicycle, are we talking about dedicated routes? Are we talking about safety? When we talk about safety, are we talking about state trails? Are we talking about, does the town have any trails? Are we biking in the streets? Do we have a problem? Are we biking in the right-of-ways? Are we biking on the boardwalk? So there's a lot of subcategories that can come out of that one category topic. We wanna work through these with the workshop leader to figure out how we can best address these at that workshop event. We may have to have the state of Delaware for bicycle. We may have to have Bike Delaware with some statistics. The local bike shop, the uh, bicycle organized, organized racing group. So there's several things we can tap into for just that one topic. So each one of these categories can have several subtopics. These are not set in stone. These are just ideas that I got from your feedback and from the surveys to try to catalog in the right order. So we'll be looking for input on these categories. So if you were to say, for example, scooters are not on here. So we would say, okay, do we need to make that a category or is it a subcategory? We wanna make sure we capture it. Are there scooter laws? Are there golf cart laws? So those are subcategories that we wanna make sure we capture in there if you have different ideas. We did have one comment on make golf carts legal on streets in our surveys. So some of the identified partners, which we'll be able to help you with, the city staff resource will be able to help us as well, as well as your local knowledge with your groups and organizations, what you do in your work, life, and play, is Bike Delaware. They're the lead in the industry. They're, uh, um, they do the statistics. They do promoting Mike, or May is Bike Month. So we'd like to bring those down, and maybe that's a special speaker. Um, and Del Dot has standards as well. Who are our users? Can they come and partner? Do they want to set up um, some information? Local groups and organizations, the police department, identified partners. Do they have problems with bicycles in the city? Let's hear from them. Local and bicycle businesses as well. The people that bike go to bike shops. The people that eat vegan necessarily do not go to the meat market. So you want the catered audience to who's using it. You want input for them. I do not bicycle myself. I wouldn't be able to tell you what everybody's concerns are. But it might be as easy as putting lighting in a dark area for safety. It might be as identifying them on a map. So these were some of the ideas in this topic of connectivity that we'd like to start you, have you start thinking about so we can build upon this with a leader. Jeff and Rick, anything on? 
add something? I, I, I was going to add to this list. I, I think um, bicycle, I mean, this, this is an easy one to talk about. So, you know, we identified some partners quickly today to populate it, but this is meant to get, to get you thinking about who's there. You know, like uh, the, the first group that I think we might want to add to this would be parents with children, because of course, you know, kids ride bikes in the streets. So, you know, you can just keep going with this until we feel like we have everything that was brought to our attention in the surveys, as well as just our own local knowledge. So this is a starting point. Yeah. We, 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 it needs improved. It Absolutely. needs developed. And this is the type of format we have for the other three or the other four as well. Just kind of helps because under categories, I could fill that page. There could be a million categories and people's observations. But how, what do we want to say about each one of them? And how can we get our partners? So the responsibility of the conference of plan, to, the, the, I think the CDP project on this is, I think we've done a great job of collecting initial data internally. We need some more or externally. We need some more internally. And this workshop helps, like, Jeff, like um, Rick was saying earlier, the opinions that were formed in the survey originally is that because the, um, some of the things just aren't known. Um, and if we can educate or provide statistics, data, or information, how can we make things better? How can we preserve and protect what we have? You know, what do we want to do in the next 10 years and what's important to the people? Um, that will help you, this type approach with the charrette and the dialogue. People tend to talk to people more one-on-one. -on -one. That's why they used to go to the post office back in the day, the grocery store, the libraries. When you come in an environment where people are sitting on one side and there's any kind of barrier at all, and people are on the other side, it's just less conducive for people to talk. Or it's the same people that talk every time. And you get a lot more from your neighbors, your friends. That's the kind of dialogue we're looking to have in these type of settings. From <clears throat> all of all ages, children to all ages. Can I, t <clears throat> can I take it? I'll peel the onion one more time <laughs> since we, we, uh, we talked about it. You know, the, uh, at the workshops, um, tactile things, uh, things that people can see, pictures, uh, even maybe interactive things. So, you know, if we can produce, uh, if one of the partners can produce a map that highlights where bicycles are, and we can ask people to say, do you know of any problem areas or dangerous intersections? And people can put a sticker or make a mark or something. So we can engage people with visuals and graphics and that sort of thing. So Michael, back to Charette's with some, some sticky notes and dots about what is an area of improvement on this map? What are, what are designated bike paths? People might not even know that already. So I think taking it to a charrette open house type environment will help. I, I do feel the planning commission is going to learn a lot by the data that's being collected that you'll see. I think the community is going to learn a lot if they decide to participate. But you provided another venue for your 10-year vision of releasing some data, statistics, and information that's going to help you form some recommendations and decisions moving forward. Yes? Is this on the website now, what you're showing us? It is not. It's a draft document. I'm going to put it on there so we can. So we're going to send it to the Planning Commission. OK. And the Planning Commission is going to be able to do some. It'll always be transparent with Rehoboth. But we're asking the Planning Commission to look at each one, sleep on it, give us a couple days and send some comments back to Rick. And then we'll start working with the local leaders, the leaders that want to volunteer, which he'll do his pitch in a minute on that, um, with the local leaders on how to start executing this and making this happen. So behind the scenes, while you're thinking about this, since we have a little bit of a structure going, we're going to be working with the staff on what facilities can we get, what days are going to work, what can we get for um, promotional materials, what are the tasks that have to be done in between. So you'll send it to us. In an email, or is it going to be in a portal? How is it going to come? It'll be in an email. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you want me to just briefly go over the, the other remaining ones? Or? Well, why, why don't you briefly go over the others? Because uh, one of the things that we want some input on, you know, just sort of off the top of your head yep. uh, input today, uh, is whether or not anything jumps out to you uh, that we might have missed in our preliminary uh, <clears throat> you know, analysis and, and what we put together for these uh, topic workshops. <clears throat> um, and then obviously, we'll be getting to a discussion about the, the team leaders, uh, team captains, and um, 
you know, asking them to follow up with the members of the Planning Commission, you know, separately uh, to get additional feedback, uh, you know, on, on these uh, topic areas. Uh, so maybe if you just quickly okay. highlight the other four yep. uh, that we have, and uh, then we can move on to uh, the leader topic. So to talk about the topic, workshop topics, we have, we just went over connectivity is one. Another one is housing. Then we have environmental, and I'll go through each one of these, economic development and quality of life. So when we started, when I started taking all the wording and the topics, we wanted to facilitate that, like we said, into hierarchy categories. The last remaining one is infrastructure. And we'd like to work with the city manager on how we can work with department heads and managers to do some kind of smaller presentation or update on what's going on with infrastructure. Because that's not, that has provided city services and a couple other. So with that, I'm gonna go into economic development. Same format, I'm gonna skip the intent, they're about the same on each one. But the categories under economic development, once again, this is a starter, starter set here, and we're looking for somebody to build upon it. Redevelopment with economic development. Maintaining existing businesses. We've heard that over and over in the survey, how important that is to not have vacant buildings and continue with the honoring and, and working with the existing businesses. New businesses, and with the new businesses also, what are our trends and attractions now? You know, when you visited Rehoboth 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, some things have changed. So there's new trends and there's new attractions that, that if you do not keep up with it, some of those, or um, indulge in some of those, it will go to the next community and the next community. So what, like you said, Main Street, you are a downtown destination is what I've heard several times. Mixed uses, we know that's a topic. Arts, entertainment, and events. That's also in quality of life, but it also has a lot to do with economic development. And then parking. Parking will have a positive or negative or neutral effect on economic development. So, yes? What do you mean by redevelopment? What are you thinking of there? So if a, let's just say I have a small single story business right now and I'm gonna tear it down and I'm gonna put another business in there. So that's a redevelopment. So it was an existing structure and re redeveloping the property. New businesses would be almost, if you have vacant land, which is probably less susceptible, brand new, I should say, um, vacant so land. these are all about businesses, not about residential. Correct, because the topic is economic development for this workshop. Okay. We do have one for residential. So the mixed use would be, that On both. include residential. Yep, we have it in the other one as well, so that's correct. Just one point. Yep. When you have redevelopment generally, usually it doesn't happen unless the new development is economically um, is, is economically more viable than what you had. In other words, for someone to tear down an existing structure and put in, whether it's one story or more, it's got to make economic sense to have the investment. And of course, there's downtime too. You know, sometimes your property's off the market for over a year. So, you know, there has to be incentives for that if that's going to happen. And it could be a blend of trends. In Rehoboth, you have to go up unless you're gonna buy the next valuable lot. So we're seeing, you're seeing more trends, taller. You're seeing the vertical growth in Rehoboth more probably than you've seen before. A lot of your applications have seen vertical growth versus horizontal growth. So you'll see for properties that are already built out, redevelopment is a big one. It's for residential and it's for commercial as well. So then, when you talk about redevelopment, there could be several subcategories. Design standards, the main street section, the mixed use. Should we have an expansion of the commercial corridor? Should we have a different overlay district for the streets that are not necessarily on the avenue but are very critical to commercial growth on either side? So there's a lot of subcategories that could fall in this as well. So you're not gonna have a wrong answer to have input and we're not gonna get into the details of anything code related. So is that probably a good assumption at this point? So we're not gonna be coming in and saying, we wanna talk about FAR. We wanna talk about how to height. We wanna talk about incentives. We wanna talk about variances. We're actually talking about this as a topic to get the dialogue going to educate on what do we have? How many new businesses has there been in the past 10 years? Can we find that information? Does the city have it? If so, we wanna reveal it. 
How many redevelopment projects do we have going on right now? That would be great to put on a map. There's a lot of projects you're gonna see in the Planning Commission, you have seen. For those that have been on here, it's continual. Um, so I think some of these we can drill down with the leaders to say what, what is it we wanna see on the topic. Yeah, and I don't, um, <clears throat> we don't want to uh, ignore adaptive reuse either. Right. You know, we have vacant buildings that are not being used. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of our redevelopment is adaptively reusing structures. The Pines is a great example. You know, there's a substantial investment there to put something into productive use. So it's not, it's not just um, the new agave on a, on a right. vacant land or tearing something down. Right. Yeah. And if they're vacant, what can you do with them while they're vacant? You know, can you have other, other experiences or other uses that can be used in those? Can you have the storefront? There's a lot of different initiatives that is more curb appeal probably than use. So some, once again, quickly, we just took a, I just took a quick brainstorm on identified partners. Believe it or not, you will know this more locally than I will. I might know a little bit more on the county and state level to bring in. Um, so I'm gonna try to stick to that level a little bit, but I want you to bring in what partners do you have? There's um, affordable housing, there's Delaware State Housing Authority for residential, but here we have Main Street. You have good resources, let's get them involved. Let's partner with them. You have the Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development, Small Business, Local Businesses, Tourism. That's just a start, so I bet you can add to those, and that's where we're looking for the input again. So you'll see on the topic, what we really want the input on is the categories, identified partners, and we know that we're missing things. We just thought this was a good part to start. And you might just want to do one a night or one during the day and put it back down again, and you're going to see some overlay. It's hard to put them all in the siphon. This yes. one is so large, you may have to break it into more than one. I mean, this covers an awful lot of things. Right, correct. Can I, can I uh, throw out a, an idea? I'm not so sure if it's a good one or a bad one, but uh, <laughs> parking is under economic development. And I'm wondering, since we have a connectivity uh, yeah. classification, if yeah. that's where parking should go, because parking is not an economic development activity in and of itself. It's the fact that the other activities may require that. However, if you're looking at connectivity and you're looking at, at uh, economic development, when you do the economic development, it could very well be, and there are communities where, in fact, they've eliminated parking because they've structured it so it has other means of connectivity to facilitate the economic development. Right. So I would, I would vote as a, a party of one uh, to take parking and put it under connectivity and yeah. pull it out of economic development. So that's a really good example of what we want everybody to do. A really, so when we give you these documents, that's exactly how we want to flow because it also affects residential. So it also affects environment. Mm -hmm. So that's a good, really good example. So when we think of it as connectivity, there's subtitles under parking that we want to consider. So that's, right. that's a great recommendation. That's exactly what we would want from the Planning Commission, this exercise. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. In, in, in they overlay so much. In urban planning, as with every, it's just, everything's connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of how much is it connected. It may be 90% yes. or maybe 2%, uh, but that 2% may leverage the other 90%, and the other 90% may not matter. Uh, so I'd vote in. Yep. That's I would great. say it's, it's almost a category of its, of its That's own. That's what I was thinking, yeah, yeah. a category by itself. Uh, traffic and parking, because when you read the surveys, and I, you know, I don't know the stats, but it looked like parking came up 60% of the time. Right. right. Parking traffic, parking traffic over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, well, maybe there's an aspect of it in every category. There, and there is. If you, there actually is parking does affect every single one of these topics in one way or another. What we wanted to do was not make a day specific to one item because there's a parking committee. They're working on the parking. What are we going to talk about on parking? We're going to bring in experts. We're going to do what maybe has been done. Um, so maybe what we do is look at the approach of a land use component versus what do we need to build, where do we need to put it? Because we're really not there yet. Where do we want to put it? We want to identify some areas of concern and things that we can do to preserve and protect moving forward. So on residents, are we building homes so large that we're not having enough parking? These are some of the things we heard in the surveys. So I think to have those as a category underneath a subcategory is probably um, keeping it more drilled to comprehensive plan and land using versus regulatory. Regulatory will come, you'll have that day within about a year or less. So, so you brought up something interesting because I've, I've um, been thinking about this myself. Parking's a great example where we have this committee of parking, but yet it's also a big topic. 
um, for this body. So how, how do we work better together and obviously get this input and determine from a That's planning good. perspective where we need to go and yep. then obviously use that parking Absolutely. committee? Right, you brought a really good point up, and we talked about this really good today. So the first thing is, you can't get your feelings hurt if other people are working on something. That's usually the rule of thumb. But the second thing is, the work they're doing has a huge impact on the work that you're doing. Every single thing that a committee is working on in Rehoboth, including the commissioners, the budget, the department heads, needs to be considered and a part of this comprehensive plan. Not everybody's gonna agree probably on the initiatives, but if the tree committee has been working on trees for 20 years, I'm gonna actually rely on them as a great resource of data, information, and initiatives that should be pulled into the comprehensive plan. The parking committee should have the same type of approach. Just like the planning commission should be knowing the zoning code probably more so than anybody and the regulations and how you're gonna to have to implement FAR, et cetera, than a tree commission. So one of, the, one of the items we talked about with these leaders is working with the city to make sure all the committees are talking to each other, at least on a chair level, with the mayor and the city manager somehow, and that information is being relayed back. So with these committee chairs, I think Rick has a vision of having the leadership position within the committees work with other committees. So there's a liaison dialogue, ongoing continual, not just the comp plan, but throughout all the activities, is that a safe assumption? <clears throat> no, that's, 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 that's a um, <laughs> um, good explanation of, of <laughs> exactly what my objective is, uh, because I think it is important that there be uh, you know, communication on a regular basis and not, not just for purposes of the CDP, which, which obviously is very important and critical at this moment, but I think even on a going forward basis that having a liaison to some of the critical, at least the critical committees uh, that you know, have an influence directly on what the planning commission is responsible for is important. And that you know, I, I know there's a frustration that people feel sometimes. I don't know that it's hurt feelings. I, I think it's, it's more a, a, a uh, efficiency uh, frustration that other committees seem to be working on topics that are within the purview of the planning commission and you know who's really in charge here you know who's who's driving you know the the initiatives uh, and i just think communication and having these team leaders uh, be liaisons to these committees is an important way to to build a better understanding of what everyone's doing how we can work together and, and harmonize uh, what's in the best interest of the city. Rick, it, it, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like it's standard procedure, for example, if we're hearing a site plan that has parking's a big issue associated with it, or maybe trees are a big issue with this particular, I mean, we don't really hear from the parking committee or the tree committee. I mean, they don't, they don't come, they don't speak. Uh, it's maybe because we don't ask them. Uh, I mean, where you can kind of, rely on their expertise i mean they know well did it did they get more about did they get notice of our agenda? well i mean yeah everyone gets notice of yeah. of, of our uh, you know what's being uh, discussed uh, as a, at our meetings because the agenda is published uh, i don't recall at least not in the few years that i've been on the planning commission that we have ever really invited uh, any uh, any representatives of other committees uh, to come and make presentations uh, to us on particular uh, applications that have been submitted. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I for one, you know, hope that we're going to do that in the context of the CDP. Um, but, you know, you make a very good point, Lee, that, you know, perhaps getting input from someone, uh, the chair of the, of the tree uh, committee uh, or, or others that, that are relevant to an application parking uh, might be useful to us and might help facilitate uh, a resolution of any issues that may be presented in applications that come before us. Uh, Glenn, is there any reason why we can't invite uh, input directly no, from those I, people? No, the, the, um, the context, when I've seen it done, is typically the chairperson from that group will come. Um, the only thing they need to be careful about is, you know, it, is there a member that's authorized to kind of speak on behalf of the committee when they when they come to see you? Because 
we want them making representations that aren't really consistent with the thinking of, of the committee. So, but, but no, there's nothing that prohibits it. And as Debbie says, I mean, they sometimes they're the experts and it's good to hear from them. Right. So from, from a planning aspect, you can also create unburdensome uh, delay process and red tape for an applicant. So some of the committees are charged, the majority of the committees are charged with activities from the city commissioners. We have this, we're forming a committee. So the charge comes from the governing body that's elected and they form committees on specific tasks, special project specific tasks, with the exception of planning commission and others. So their tasks are usually project specific or issues they're having um, or initiatives that they want to follow. So for example, the parking committee. The parking committee that gets formed has specific initiatives that their investigation reports. There's collecting data, reporting back. Um, I think one of the things is that just the communication alone, rather than have each body come in and go through a site plan process, I think you're gonna find the tree committee might be more advantaged for the planning commission to say, when we get to rewriting the tree ordinance or the zoning code, you've been doing this work for five years, we wanna bring you in. But to have it on every single, on, on a site plan. So remember, they're initiative driven and they're recommending bodies. So, so let me the just- The project specific more so than you are on site plan specific, your expertise in that field. Um, if you have a task where you say, our code says that we have to do Leland Cypresses on every single property, that doesn't work in Rehoboth. That's a charge that you can bring back to the city manager to say, we'd like the tree committee to look at this because it's been an issue on the site plan process. But there's, a, there's an existing, and I'll say recent, maybe not existing, recent example, very recent example. Um, and, and unfortunately, I'm sure we probably saw this in the Cape Gazette in the last two weeks. There was an article that was written about the um, board, beach and boardwalk committee um, putting out uh, new laws and rules around dogs. Right. In Rehoboth, and here we're, we're. I don't know about you, but I was reading that for the first time in the Cape. They, they weren't, it wasn't really new. It was the old old regulation, right. I think. But but my point but is, it's never been enforced. Well, okay, but I'm not sure where that all started. So maybe there is more history here. But it, based on the survey information that we all received, what I read certainly wasn't aligning with the feedback that we were seeing in the survey. So it, I'm not sure where. So that that's a good example. Came from if it's commissioners. Right. It, but my point coming back to this whole initiative here is if that's been decided and that group has already been kind of delegated right to go off and work on that, then we really shouldn't be spending an awful lot of time as a topic on that. But to me, it didn't really align with all of the data. So you're going to have that. Survey. It, it's a good point. In between these ten years, we do this document. It's outdated the day you do it. In between these 10 years, you used to have free dogs everywhere without leashes everywhere. You didn't have to have poop bags. Now you have to have recycled. There's a lot of different laws that have happened and evolved over the years. When this 10-year comprehensive plan is done, we have a vision, but you cannot predict the next trend. Um, a good trend that is very huge right now is auxiliary dwelling, auxiliary dwelling units. That's small houses. We call them mother-in-law quarters on, on different areas. So that trend could be so high and so in demand in Rehoboth in five years, we didn't see it coming. People do not want single family homes. They want smaller, lesser, play more, more affordable. That could be a huge trend that Rehoboth Beach has to either feel if they're gonna embrace, if it's happening naturally, like some of our other trends, or if it's gonna go to the next neighboring committee. So in that 10 year mark, there's operational and enforcement items that will not come to planning commission. And the planning commission is not the be all end all to everything, it is the city commissioners. So, and it's driven by land use re recommendations by the 10 year comprehensive plan, code regulations, which everybody has agreed need to be updated from the planning commission's angle to the city staff to everywhere. So the job here will not fix every single thing, every single policy. It's, it's a land use document versus a policy document. I th Mike I might help me out with that. To Rachel's point, I think it's very important, and, and based on Glenn's comments, that the comprehensive plan is required by the state. And there's only two, well, there's a whole series of organizations, the Tree Committee and the Boardwalk Committee and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are only two committees that are legally uh, empowered from the standpoint of, that are appointed by the commissioners, that's us and the Board of Adjustment. And in our case, our case is to 
take the existing code, the existing code, and apply it, which is very thick, and we've all agreed up to this point that the code has got a lot of flaws in it, but that's the whole reason there's going to be a process that's undertaken to address that, which we may or may not be a part of. Hopefully we will be. But separate and distinct is the comprehensive plan, which is that sort of the third leg of that. Um, and go back to the original comment about these various committees, perhaps they should be, when, when we get a, a site plan, they should be notified. As a committee, they don't have any legal standing as we do. However, they're just an assemb a, a group of people. And all people have the right to come before this committee when a site plan uh, is presented and present their issues. So if someone comes in and says, well, I'm the chair of the boardwalk committee, that's nice. <laughs> and you represent a series of people. That's nice, too. But you don't have legal standing in, from the standpoint that we have, that we have to deal with the issues to interpret the code. People express their opinions, but we have to interpret the code. And so I think there's a, a, a defining difference there. I think it's also sending a lot of signal and confusion, right, to the community. In the example that I'm giving around the, you know, the proposed law that's been published in the Cape Gazette. Right. So if that group doesn't have really the authority to really build that Well, they can language, make a recommendation, well, which they have. But, but that's not the way it comes across, right? The messaging around it is, this is proposed, this is our job, this is what we think. You know, we're going to tell you the length of your leash and... It could be from the police, leash or not. but that I mean, could come from police, silliness. that could come from code enforcement, that could come from a law that's never been enacted that is updated. Right. So where they, where decisions from the commissioners come, the person that knows the most about that is the person that's running the city, which is the city manager and the departments. And any code regulation change has to be right. done in a public forum. And while it, why it is changed gets justified in a public forum. Where it comes from, why they did it, how they did it is done through it has to be done through a public hearing. Am I correct, um, Glenn, for it, ordinance it, changes? It depends. I mean, not, not, not all legislative changes require a public hearing. Zoning ones certainly correct. do. The, 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 the animals committee on, on the issue that, <laughs> that you've raised, um, they did meet, they, they met several times. And it's, a, it's kind of a comprehensive revision they did to the animals chapter. But, but they did make a recommendation to the commissioners. The commissioners debated it for... I think three meetings before they ended up adopting new legislation, but it was initiated in the Animals um, Issues Committee. Um, but it did, it did eventually go to the commissioners, though, who, who voted on it. So, but there, there is some legislative, there are some legislative changes that don't require a public hearing. In Rehoboth Beach, we're very good, I would say, about whenever there is going to be in a legislative change allowing some form of public input. It may not be a formal, legally required public hearing, but it's rare that I, I don't know if I can recall any time where there was a legislative change that had absolutely no public comment period. My understanding about that uh, statute or that ordinance is that it's been on the books for a long time, and so the committee looked at it right. to make suggested changes. They did not suggest that some of the things, you can't walk on the sidewalk, <laughs> you can't walk on the road, that was already existing. And the changes they recommended to the council, I mean, to the commissioners, was the, I guess, the length of the leash, the fine. So that's, I guess, where it is right now. But so I don't think it was, it, it didn't come out of a committee. It was already existing. Let's, let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. Um, for example, if you had a site plan, which would require a lot of trees to be removed, it wouldn't be inappropriate to ask the tree committee to submit written comments about that. You know, so you have certain specific things that a committee might, you know, might be a very good thing to have them comment on it. They don't necessarily have to even appear. They can submit a written comment. And that's generally what I've experienced in other jurisdictions where you have a controversial application, whether it's the, um, you know, whether it's the uh, Sierra Club or it's the bikers or whomever, they usually submit a written comment and they may even appear and, and uh, present testimony. And so nothing says that we couldn't, even though they get our general, um, you know, they get our agenda, nothing says we couldn't uh, reach out to the chair of a certain committee and say, do you guys want to submit a written comment on this application? The thing, I think the one recommendation I'd probably just have 
from doing a lot of Delaware zoning codes is if they meet the code and the code is outdated and you don't like it and they still meet the code, they do have some by right to develop and move forward. If the code is outdated and you're asking for updating with input on it, but to get to ask one applicant the consistency of that is to ask one applicant to get special recommendation from a committee and maybe not do it to the next applicant is that fine line that I definitely recommend legal solicitation on. Yeah, we, we have currently in our, in our ordinance for site plan reviews um, a requirement that de certain department heads um, provide written comments. And you know, I can think of an instance in Lewis where certain applications require um, comments from the, the Parks Commission, and, and I can't recall which, but, but, but it's every, every applicant for that type of a development ha gets treated the same. And I think that's where you're going to sort of an equal protection claim. You want to be sure that all applicants <laughs> get treated equally um, and they have the same amount of process applied, applied to them. So I, I agree yep. that there are some instances where- And like Lee, you alluded to last time that maybe we tighten up the requirements of what gets done before the application comes to you. Yeah, um, as far I, I as the, the process. As Stephen said, in, in other jurisdictions where, much larger jurisdictions, mm -hmm. where they actually have a yep. transportation department, Absolutely. a parks and recreation mm -hmm. department, a zoning office, a public utility office, and a site plan comes in and it's, it's circulated to every one of yep. them. They all make their comments, whatever they might be, and then they send them all back to the planning commission so that we've heard from the parking mm -hmm. office, because obviously they know more about Right. the parking than we do on a day-to-day -day basis. They've studied it all, and they all submit their comments, and a lot of them are no comment. Right. They just say, it looks fine it's to me. Code. There's no, there's, yeah, it meets code. There's no issues. Yep. Every now exactly. and again, you get a comment. You know, you get... Lee's exactly right on that, and uh, basically it gets vetted before it comes to the uh, commission for its decision, and, you know, you have the... Imp what happens is they all do that. They submit it to the staff. The staff does a, you know, does its thing and makes a recommendation to the planning board. And it so that's has, standard has, practice, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Rehoboth does not, they have mechanisms to be able to have the staff do that. When you go to rewrite the zoning code, we probably want to look at the process for submittals, application, et cetera, because it's not where you want it to be right now. But that's a zoning code change that should be identified in our implementation section of, you know, wanting to get more detailed reviews internally before it comes to the Planning Commission versus maybe a topic, because these workshops we don't have as set up as code-driven yet because we want to get information to figure out what sections of the codes that we do need to talk about in land use. I know we kind of got off, in, but to clarify, there will be several other things that are going to be done, enacted, approved, voted on, being completed by other um, groups while you're going through this. Our job is to get that information from the city manager, the staff, the departments, to make sure it's incorporated and it's given to you for consideration. So we're going to be that funnel of valuable information. So these next, you know, eight, nine months that we're working on this, they're still open for business and they're still gonna move forward with their tasks that are given from other committees. Debbie, excuse me, I'm a little bit confused. Maybe if you give me some examples. Are we going to determine the categories that we're gonna do for the workshops at some point in time? Are they, are those the ones you put up there? Yes. So those are the so categories we'll do. The f we're recommending five, but we're asking for planning commission input. This is not, this is a start to the framework. So then we'll have those five topics and yes. then, okay. And then you'll have this sub. So when you look at this homework, it'll be economic development. There's seven categories. Like for example, right now, we have one recommendation to take parking out of this. Then we'll, we'll take the parking removal unless somebody else has a different idea. And we'll start having this be more of a format that we can follow to then get the right um, information from the leaders to move forward on actually enacting it. So let's go through the others then. Okay. So then economic development, let's do quality of life. I, I, I fixed all of them. So quality of life category, there's several of these. I quickly just summarized it in four that I know of, so we're looking for input again. We pulled it from surveys and your information. Organized recreation activities and events. This is growing. This is a year-round town. Um, I was shocked at how many things just get held at the convention center since I got their schedule. Now look at everything running. Every single weekend there's a race of some kind. There's, there's a very active, um, so organized recreational activities and events. We need to do some promotion. How do you support these? What do we do? Each one of these activities, which talking to the staff, could develop into more resources. Do we need police to be able to man these? How is that handled? Do we, so we're thinking land use and resources is probably 
and education. Recreational facilities, all across the surveys, all we heard about was the beach and the boardwalk, beach and boardwalk, you know, how great it is. How are we gonna preserve those? How are we gonna protect those? How are you gonna maintain those? The resources and the staff to be able to do those. The parks, the bandstand is growing. There's constantly a lot of stuff happening at the bandstand. And there's several others. I just listed out the ones that I got from the surveys. Arts and entertainment is growing. If you want a concert or uh, music or entertainment, that's constantly happening as well in the community. And then the safety as well. What kind of safety should we be concerned of? What, what's our um, heat map crime? What kind of crime do we have? What, do we need better lighting? Do we have dark areas? Do we have areas where everybody's comfortable, safe for all several reasons? So those were just some of the categories that you can build upon. We threw some ideas out. And then identified partners, we definitely know we need to hear from city management and the departments. They hold a lot of that information. Um, they can tell us how strained the resources or more land use that needs to be done to accommodate this growth. The police department's another partner we probably need to hear from and get data from. And then organizations that organize all these. How can, you, how can we help grow, them grow? How can we make people more safe when we have a population quadrupled the size for an event? Are they working okay? Do we have transportation issues to get people into the large events? So this quality of life can go even further. There's a lot of topics on quality of life. So in this exercise, as you were saying, Barry was going with what other categories would we have under quality of life and what other identified partners can you think of? So to me, this exercise would be, does everything that we're capturing fall into one through four? Or do you have subcategories under safety? Is it lighting? Is it you know, several other things? So that's what we're looking at for additional input to make sure we're capturing it. And from then, we'll be dealing with the leader that wants to step up and um, actually lead this effort with a workshop. And they'll be communicating with So us. are we going to be the leaders? Or are we going to have professionals do that? We're going to. No. no, we're it. Yep. OK. We have support from us no, and support I, it, from the staff. Yeah. Um, I'm going to dodge this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that what, one what, what Debbie and Jeff and I attempted to do was to put forth five topic areas that you know we felt um, were identified by the members of the Planning Commission based on their homework, and to at least begin to put the bare bones structure on the categories and the identifiable parties you know, that we want to bring in to assist us in these workshops and in our you know, thinking uh, and, and process for the CDP. Um, <clears throat> but looking to each of you for further input and once we get to the point of you know, getting volunteers to lead on these topics, um, having the leaders go independently to other members of the Planning Commission, not in a formal setting, you know, just one-on-one -on -one discussions, you know, do you see anything that we should be putting in here? Are there additional categories or subcategories that you think we should identify and we should be working towards, you know, being sure that those are covered in these workshops? So these are the initial building blocks. And, you know, in the very near future, we really need to dive in and, and start rolling up our sleeves and communicating with each other individually on these topics and getting this off the ground and running so that we can start these workshops uh, you know, in the time frame that we've at least initially identified. Um, so I... <clears throat> and I think we, did, we didn't want this to be intimidating for somebody to say, I don't want to do that topic because it's controversial. Well, we're not making the workshops to controversial, or controversial at all. We're not having controversial dialogue. We're actually talking about some of the things that are happening, what is going to happen, some other statistics and documents, supportive data, to talk really about land use, what people like, what we want to preserve, how we want to move forward. And it's that kind of dialogue that's happening. We're actually not looking at sitting down with housing and saying, do we need more 55 or older? I mean, we're not getting into, do we need to make the houses bigger or smaller? So that's more policy driven. These dialogues that you're going to have will come back and be able to help us determine implementation. But in this whole comprehensive plan, we will never see something that says all lots should be 50 by 100. All houses should be two stories. That's policy driven, and you're not there yet. So Mike, I'm trying to explain land use here, and we're staying out of policy at this time. It, and I'm not sure. I'm just kind of leaning on my land use uh, cohort there. To, to say we won't be getting into policy, we won't be getting into incentives, we won't be getting into what the holdups are really at this level. This is a land use driven, preserve, protect. I think it'll be a short workshop. 
So here's the question. How many people know that, that um, there's a wayfinding way sign program that's going to be installed? There's two phases. OK, how'd you find that out? Website, reading, attending a meeting, hearing about it? Commissioner. OK, great. OK, so the people that don't know about the wayfinding signs, there are people in town that do not know where to go, how to get there. You have a parking problem because they won't go a block. Wayfinding installation sign program alone can eliminate a lot of the things that people talked about in the survey. If they're implemented properly, they're effective and it's a program. So those things, to me, if there's anything we can bring to the planning commission who's created a 10-year vision plan to learn in any of these workshops, we have kind of double dipped. For the planning commission to learn some of the reports and statistics and everything we have, for the staff to be able to provide maybe for the first time statistics and data that people haven't seen. That helps, helps us get better educated to make land use decisions implementation goals and strategies for this document. So from the public aspect, we know that parking is a top, we know from the surveys, parking, FAR, et cetera. But we haven't heard a lot about crime. We haven't heard a lot about other, other areas. Why aren't we hearing about crime? Because it's not in the newspaper every day? Is it not happening at all? So how do we get to where, what the parking problem is? Let's find out what the parking committee did. Let's find out and educate and have the parking committee talk about parking and figure out a map that shows how many parking spaces do we have that are available in the city of Rehoboth Beach. It's never been mapped, to the best of my knowledge. So do we have a parking problem or do we have available parking? What's free, what's private, what's public? Yes. Debbie, when you say, um, and I understand, these meetings are not to be controversial. Well, they will be, but we're, yes. <laughs> I agree, that was a great, great catch. Okay. Um, but are we going to address um, the rental properties in, you know, that are, that are really many hotels in the, is that going to come up here or? That might be under housing. I don't know. We haven't done the last two, so. So I'm under. Sorry, I didn't hear you. That might be under housing. She hasn't covered that one. Or it's what we have up on the screen now that she's referring to. She's referring to what's up on the screen now. Oh. So Joyce, that's a good question because what I, mean, I where would, do these problems that people write about, where do they come up? So if we're talking about rental properties, right. the first thing I'd like I mean, to do, first thing example. we do is we work with code enforcement to say, let's talk about licensing. What are the problems with rental properties? Is it overcrowding? Is it licensing? Is it parking? Is it age? So in order to get down to what the true root of the areas that need improvement, we have to have dialogue with everybody. Because rentals can't be 100% a part of the problem in Rehoboth because it's also part of the success of Rehoboth. Right. <laughs> so when we talk about this, what data can we collect? What data, there's a brand new Sussex housing um, report that was done for Sussex County. A whole entire housing analysis in Sussex County. Let's find out what that has to say. And let's report that out. Let's bring that to the commission and the public. Let's find out what our licensing department has to say here. How many rental properties do we have? And what do they capture when we get them? And what's the trend? Is it increasing? Is square foot increasing? Are our license fees only $20 and we're not inspecting? So we have to get to kind of what data do we have? What data I think are we missing? And then having conversations. If you and I were to sit at a table together or walk out in the parking lot, you might share with me, not, not saying, you might share with me that you have a problem with rentals in one specific area of that. Maybe it's parking. We say, okay, what's the problem with parking? Do we not require enough? for a seven bedroom house? Do we require it to be paved? Do we require too much lot coverage? So are we hurting this trend or helping this trend with outdated codes and what can we do with it in the comp plan? So we do think that the workshop setup would have people be more honest and real, but you kind of have to peel away the onion layers to find out what, what people really think are the problems. And, and you don't think we got that in the survey? I, I don't think we detailed it enough um, I've only been here living in Rehoboth for a month, and when you hear conversations, it is passionate, I'm for it, or passionate, I'm against it, and it could be the same topic. So when I hear somebody say against anything, because I'm not a negative person, why? And you peel back the layers, and it's maybe, this isn't the town it used to be 60 years ago, but yet the value of your house you really like. So when you peel away kind of the onion layers, you want to find out why people are upset or what, they, what they're not happy with, and is it collective or is it individual? Because you have a diverse, the housing market's diversity, the population's so diversity. Controversial things they will. can mm -hmm. come up. And I, what'll be great is you will be having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people about it. 
So you'll be sharing data back. So there'll be stations where you'll be talking to people just like we're talking now, and you'll get information that will not be related to somebody's name, and we can share it collectively to put it in the document and make decisions. I have a question for Glenn. Um, Rick said earlier that each of us should get together with another uh, member, like at a coffee shop, and discuss additional categories. Is that going to violate FOIA? Good question. Uh, no, it, it won't. Um, it, this comes up a lot about who can meet with whom and, and when. So that no problem if the two of you would like to get together over coffee. It doesn't have to be noticed publicly or any of that. You two get together, it's fine. Um, what happens then, the problem only happens when, first of all, if a quorum of you get together, obviously a quorum can't get together at a, at a shop without it being noticed. But the, you get into this serial meeting issue of the two of you talk and discuss and you kind of develop, we think this would be a neat thing to, you know, you're talking about CDP issues and you come to a conclusion about some topic that's gonna to be addressed in CDP. Then one of you goes to Jeff, Jeff, hey, we talked, we thought, we thought this was kind of neat. Jeff says, I'm in agreement, that's a great idea. Jeff goes to Rick, and then at some point you're gonna get a quorum of you all having the same knowledge, coming to maybe the same conclusion or, 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 or are developing a conclusion. That's when you get in issues of um, violations of the open meeting rules. So it's fine for one or three of you to say, let's get together and talk about a topic without publicly noticing it. But it's only when it gets to a quorum, whether it be in that single setting or through a series of conversations. So that's, what, that's the only real thing you have to watch out for. So from a planning perspective, as we prepare for each one of these topics, we probably will have to have oh, absolutely. more meetings, right, with more people versus one person having to meet with each person. That would be incredibly taxing, you know? Yeah, so I agree. at some point we're gonna have to organize, right, and kind of coordinate roles and that's exactly where we're, that is yeah. exactly where we're at right now exactly because what we're trying to do is say we are looking for each person on the planning commission to be a workshop leader um, or participate and be active that we can work with and we can facilitate the structure of this idea that you can facilitate it through the rest of the we envision next month to come back and have a game plan we really need to be done with this you're on a timetable we've done enough outreach we've got to now focus topics we have to start writing. So behind the scenes, I'm starting to write. I'm starting to come up with implementation ideas from every single meeting we talk about things. I'm pulling the census data, the demographics. We're pulling data from the city. There's a lot behind the scenes happening that I've asked to give an update next month. Um, and we'll give you links of documents to be able to review and um, obtain more information. But right now we're saying we have to be organized, we have to be focused, and these are the topics with your approval and input um, and then that'll get us through the March, April time frame to then come back and have all this collected data say, now let's talk about how can we improve this? What's our implementation? What's our land use? Do we need a mixed use overlay? Do we need a mixed use zoning district? Is mixed use something that needs to be further researched and we're not ready to make a decision? I think I'd, I'd like to move this along to the next stage um, and talk about uh, topic leaders. Um, and I did get an email from Mark. Um, he unfortunately is under the weather and his whole family is suffering with the flu, uh, which is why he didn't make it here today. Um, so despite, you're gonna nominate him for one? <laughs> despite the fact that, that, uh, that they all got flu shots, apparently didn't work uh, in this instance. Uh, and so he also indicated that he is watching this live stream. Uh, so Mark, since you're not here, you're getting all of the topics to lead. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, the, the, the intent is, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, designating people and saying, you have to take this topic, Rachel, or Steve, you have to take this topic. Uh, again, as we said, we've identified five topic areas, one of which is infrastructure, and as Debbie has indicated, that's something we need to flesh out with, with the city manager and, and, and some others. Uh, you know, before we think about whether or not that's a workshop topic or not. Um, but <clears throat> my hope and desire, given, you know, the enthusiasm that I've seen, you know, in, in this, this uh, planning commission this year, uh, was that, you know, people would be willing to step up to the plate and volunteer to be a leader of a particular topic that they may have a, a specific interest in. Um, and others could assist that person. Uh, 
you know, even if they're not a topic leader, uh, since we haven't identified nine topics, but, <clears throat> you know, that they're, they're uh, Debbie's now coming up with four more topics. Two, yeah. No, you could do two leaders. You could double up. Like, if one of you wants to blame the other one, it would be, you could have a co-captain, but we could have, yeah, we, like, we, you we, have we, enough if, you, we, if you're not comfortable by yourself or however you want to do it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that, that's certainly a possibility, and that's open for discussion. I mean, I, I, you know, let's talk about uh, how you feel we can best uh, bring these workshops forward. Our desire was to have people... Uh, you know, step up for a topic, and then Debbie, Jeff, and I were going to have an initial uh, either in-person meeting or a conference call uh, to talk about how, you know, we're going to structure this, how we're going to help you, what kind of resources uh, the city is going to make available, what kind of resources KCI can make available, how Jeff and I can, can be of help to you in, uh, in your efforts. Uh, but relying on the leaders who, who have been identified to you know, sort of be the point person, uh, working working with us and uh, you know getting getting these workshops off the ground. Uh, Jeff, did you want to add anything to that? I mean, I, I think you've set it up nicely. Uh, the <laughs> the um, you know I, I, everybody is going to be contributing to every uh, to every workshop. So uh, it's going to be really important that um, we all attend. And um, the outputs from the workshop uh, are, are a large part we're going to discuss here at a follow-on meeting. So, you know, for housing, you know, hopefully uh, all nine commissioners will be there. We'll be interacting with people. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, what our impressions were of the, impre of the, um, the presentations, the displays you know, um, what types of folks showed up, you know, did we get a sample that we think was meaningful, you know, did we have anecdotal information? So the, the, the output is going to be group learning and, you know, it's not going to be the same for everybody. We're going to talk to different people and have different impressions, but, but, but the value is, um, the value is on both sides, the input and the output, you know, doing all we can in the next month to make sure that to the best of our ability, we've covered all the topics that we've been exposed to, um, building the best workshop we can, and then simply participating is, it's, that, that's all there is to it, really. It's simple at one level, but it's gonna require a lot of effort. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I see the, the leaders as, uh, you know, sort of the traffic cops for these workshops, and also, you know, being the ones to coordinate the kind of input that will be available to the members of our community. So, for example, if, if you take, you know, the housing, uh, you know, among other presenters or, or you know, other, you know, uh, information you might want to include uh, at, a, at a station or a table there, whatever you, we want to call them, uh, might be somebody who has expertise in permeable surfaces. Uh, you know, what permeable surfaces, you know, might the city consider uh, allowing, for example, for driveways, sidewalks, things of that nature, uh, you know, that may, uh, you know, promote uh, better use of land. And, uh, you know, there are any number of different uh, topics within these categories that would lend themselves to bringing in outside experts and vendors and, uh, people with, with knowledge of various things that affect uh, housing in Rehoboth, uh, you know, to provide information. And so working with KCI, working with Jeff and myself, and with the city, uh, you know, you would help identify, you know, the resources that we, that we bring in to, uh, to provide this information to the community. Uh, and as, as I said at the outset also, I mean, I'd like to get that one-on-one -on -one feedback from the people who are attending. I think that's important for all of us. Uh, I never intended, at least from my standpoint, that you know the leader was going to be uh, you know tasked and responsible for coming back with just you know their views on on what they learned at uh, the workshop meetings, and that that's going to be the adopted view of the planning commission. I think you know at some point you know that coordination 
uh, of all of our views uh, will have to take place here at the Planning Commission uh, meetings themselves. And we may discover that we're gonna have to have some special meetings uh, depending upon you know, what our workload is, particularly in the coming months with potential applications coming forward. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do, and you know, my, my expectation was that by at least having designated leaders for these topics, we're sort of sharing and, and the responsibilities to make it more efficient and, and in the long run less burdensome on us as a group. Uh, so I guess with, with that, I'd, I'd and just so you know, three of those topics are three chapters in your comprehensive plan. There's Economic development, housing, and environmental, our environment are three of the chapters out of the plan. So it covers a lot. And, and are, I'm are, sorry, go, go just go back to, I think, our first meeting where you had in your mind a date where you wanted to have a kind of a working draft of the um, PC. You so mean what, the, the one that gave Debbie heart failure? Yeah. Yes. Still does. Yeah, it was November. <laughs> November. Of 2020. Oh, yes, 2020. we are we are making up time here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're. Yeah. So what happened with the surveys can't happen with the workshops. So we have a brand new group here that we need to get it done in 30 days, laid up. So I just have a question around this whole process. So here we go through the workshops. Will, based on this timeline, be done early April, it seems. Um, and then from there, what are the other steps before we start? So from there, while you're doing that, the next meeting, I'm going to give you a list of all the data that we've been trending, watching, reading that would be pertinent or have an effect or negative positive effect on Rehoboth, which is about three pages of stuff. And they're about 150 pages each document. So staying the approach that we could take is we can have workshops by topic to say, let's talk about economic development, which is a chapter. What have we learned? What have our demographics and census data say? What are the areas of improvement we have? How do we make, so we have to go into goals for each chapter, strategies and implementation. So that's the process we'll be working, working on from then. And it's a lot easier, which we'll formulate a little bit more as we go with this. It's a lot easier if it's topic driven, because if not, we get off on tangents. Right, but coming yeah. out of the workshops, then it's really more about Oh, yeah. Yep. Collecting. Right? Absolutely. What are those key themes? What are the what's the data that goes along with it? Yep. What's the implementation? Mm -hmm. And then starting to kind of formalize. And we will be giving you the we will be giving you a draft chapter to start from, which is the bones. And when I say the bones, I mean that's what's required by the state. So I'm going to give you a prefabric or, or pre-written chapter that has the requirements met by the state. Right. Now, how, what we interpret it, where we go from there, is where we need the input. Mm -hmm. So. We won't change facts, data, and stats, and trends, but that'll help you understand how you want to get where you want to go. You know, one, one of the things that Debbie will be giving to us at the next meeting, uh, as she indicated, is this list of what they have been following, you know, what they have uh, already identified as, as valuable information, reports, and things of that nature. And she's going to try to put uh, links in there so that if you have a desire to go and read a 150-page report on housing, uh, you'll be able to, you know, hit the hit the button on your computer and you know uh, go to that document and read as much of it as, as you want uh, to to inform yourself. And and uh, you know I <clears throat> I'm not sure that we need to read every single document of these I don't know 120 150 uh, that may be on that list at this point. Uh, but at least they'll be there identified and uh, we'll be able to, mm -hmm. to source them ourselves if, if we want to. So one good example I can tell you is the governor's annual planning report came out in October. Um, and in that document, the first thing we do is any comprehensive plans I have, the staff starts going through it and saying, oh, this would be something that could work for Rehoboth. This might be something that's Rehoboth affected or it starts talking about Sussex County. So we start taking out data that would be um, help for initiatives, help for trends, help for um, funding that the state or federal government's going off of, and we start forming data from that to start writing the chapters, and there's several of those. The state, the Sussex County Housing Report just came out. So there's continual, like, census data. Anything that comes out, we're trying to earmark it to be able to pull it into your document for supportive data, I should say. Right. I, Debbie, I have one question uh, before I volunteer. Oh. The... Uh, the dates that are currently for the end of March, early April, are those, is that time frame pretty firm? Because the problem I have is I'm not here those two weeks. <laughs> and then you're going to volunteer. <laughs> Which really 
<laughs> it also falls right in spring break season for us to have children. Well, this is important. This, this is yeah. important, important information for us to gather here. I mean, that's why, as Debbie said, yeah. you know, th these were tentative dates, mm -hmm. um, and those dates were really driven by the Saturdays that were available for the convention center. Um, and obviously, we can't get too far into the year uh, to move this process forward, but we do still have some flexibility. Uh, you know, and we, we can look at, at would it be easier to frames. get dates that do not work as I'm working on dates for facilities. Yeah, that, from I, the I, I think that I think that would be helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. And you don't ha don't have to do it here and now. Um, but you know, obviously, we will work we to accommodate, to. <laughs> you know, the, the timeframes that work for the individual commissioners. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, either find facilities elsewhere other than the convention center. I, I would hope that nevertheless we could get this done, you know, by the end of April or middle of May uh, at least. Um, so do you want me to give you the three just hypothetical dates right now we talked about? Sure. Yeah. Now there's, we don't have any commitment from anybody to have a facility. So this is literally grabbed out of the air right now. But we initially talked about March 21st two workshops, and once again, this is not official in any capacity. Um, April 4th and April 5th, that's a Saturday and a Sunday. Another two workshops, and then a half a workshop on Sunday in the morning. That is Palm Sunday weekend, so for many schools, I, I don't have children at home anymore, but for many schools. Oh, because Easter is the 11th and 12th. That does start to really get into the public school and Catholic school. So areas. would they? Would they be out the third? They would probably be out um, that next week. And I don't know about the college schedules. They're usually earlier. But so would we maybe be able to pull off the fourth, but not? Passover in there, too, by the way. I just looked it up. We got one. Yeah. The, and then you've got yeah, the 11th and 12th and 10th we're staying away from. Oh, so then if we did the fourth and fifth, or at least the fourth to get two in. Yes, Palm know. Sunday, okay. Yeah. So those are the tentative right now, and we don't even know if we can get a facility, but that's what we initially just looked at today. That's only four workshops, don't you have another one? Pardon me? Don't you, that's four workshops. I that's, that would be five if we did the, if we did the fifth, which was something we wanna work, at, work on not doing if we don't Can we do the, the March 21st and 22nd? Is the 22nd open to get a Sunday in there? No, so the, the 22nd is available, yes, today. We want to try to get in front of that, but back to spring break, we'll have to look at those dates. So what we said once again was March 21st through <laughs> April 5th is our window that we're looking at the sweet spot of availability for facilities. Um, we didn't want to push it up further in early March because we don't have enough time to get the information out and work with the leaders. That would be ideal, but yep. I don't think we have time. And I have a question on the quality of life. So is the intent of this to look at quality of life as it relates to what Rehoboth offers from the resident, the visitor, and the business, like we did with surveys? Or is the quality of life focused on residents? So help, help me, what is? So there is not a classification the on the workshops as far as do you own land, don't you own land? Are you over 18? Are you under 18? Are you part-time, part-time seasonal? It is. Every age, everybody's welcome without a focus on a specific, because we've done that in the study. Yeah. The survey defined that. That was an opportunity. Yeah. Our census and demographics defined who lives here, who doesn't. We have that rude, real raw data. So this is to, to determine, to educate, promote, and obtain data on areas that we can improve or we need to preserve. And that can come from anybody. I, I'm just thinking I, I about think, the perspective, right? Yeah. So, so in this case, quality of life could be a huge opportunity from a business perspective, yes. right? Absolutely. It certainly could be from a visitor perspective to right. have Healthy people come with yep. you or you get <clears throat> to enjoy more of the city, yes. right? Yes, yep. So, and then from the residents, obviously, <laughs> them also having... Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think you'd have to look at this as, you know... Uh, Kind of as, a, as a homogeneous oh, community, yeah, yes. you know, yeah. that, that, you know, there are many different aspects of our community that affect our quality of life. Absolutely. Not just one. I mean, there's, there could be lack of medical, but there's a promotion of um, healthy communities. So there's, there's a lot, yeah, that go into connectivity. 
Yep. So we do, there's gonna be a lot of crossing we feel over. And if there's opportunities where we have, you have you know, somebody from this organization that speaks specifically of this and the same organization the next workshop, then we'll, we'll bring, the more education, the more partners we have, the better it would be. Yeah, I mean, I, there's no I, wrong ideally if, if we could pin down some dates and, and I think that if uh, each of you could send, uh, send me uh, dates that don't work mm -hmm. yes. for you, uh, within the next, say, three months, uh, really, really from March through April to maybe to mid-May, uh, if we have to stretch it that far. Uh, and then Jeff and Debbie and I can work on uh, sourcing out available locations for the workshops, and we will do our utmost to accommodate your time schedules yes. and, and you know, when, when you can do this. The one thing I will say, however, is that I think it's important to identify the leaders or co-leaders, however you want to do that uh, today, uh, if we can, yes. uh, because uh, Debbie, Jeff, and I would like to have at least an initial coordinating meeting or telephone conference call with you within the next 10 days, <clears throat> because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, and we probably would need to have, you know, before the workshop, you know, at least two of those meetings or conference calls with the leaders or co-leaders. So Mike, a good example, whatever one you're getting ready to volunteer for, because I'm dying to know, <laughs> um, whatever one you're getting ready to volunteer for, we would try to work in the schedule to make sure that your workshop is not held, if we can, amongst the leaders, that the time you cannot permit it. Okay. So we'd try to work with the leaders exactly. in their schedule right. and make, our job is just to say, facility, we got two workshops, which ones are they? Which, who's available? So we'll try to accommodate those, I would assume, as best as possible. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm gonna volunteer for, and I'd also like to make a comment. I'll volunteer for connectivity and infrastructure. Yes, okay. um, But I would like to make a comment, and, and um, which I think is important, it relates to something that Steve had said at a previous meeting, that um, he'd like to see the CDP be succinct because it is a strategic document. Um, that having been said, uh, technically, with all that's been developed so far with the survey that we did and with all, all of the, the boilerplate stuff that, that the state requires of us, we technically have enough to write a CDP. Absolutely. What we're doing, and I know there's only two of us that have been here for the previously that, that did a CDP, um, so we don't have to do these. Technically, we don't have to do them. But the reason we're doing them, to, to Debbie's point, is to get a little bit more of the sort of the soft stuff, even though we got the survey and we have all the data, to see if we get anything else. And then the result of that is we're gonna create it. Now, I, I think it, 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 it pays to, to, to say this, is the current Sussex County CDP is actually pretty good. Yes. The one they did 20 years ago wasn't worth the paper to blow it. It, it was totally worthless. And they didn't do any outreach at all. This they, round? They, no, the, the previous oh, one, yeah. 20 years oh, ago. Yeah. It was written for the sole purposes so that they didn't have to do anything for the state or, or, or anybody else, and they <laughs> basically told everybody to go to hell. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. We're doing the polar opposite of that, is we're trying to be as inclusive as, poss as possible. At the same time, much of what was in the current CDP is still true. Things haven't changed for a lot of things, and there's a lot of things that needed to be done that weren't done, that should have been done, that still need to be done. And now there's some new phenomena in the last five years that have occurred, which weren't anticipated in the CDP, which now we have to in consider in the CDP for our benefit of our community and the benefit within the state. So these workshops, I don't wanna say are icing on the cake, yeah. but, but technically we have enough to run with what we have right now to work with the commissioners and to say X, you know, this is, this is what the CDP is gonna be. So I, I think that, um, I don't want everyone else to think that there's sort of this tremendous stress that, that God, we're gonna screw it up. Uh -oh. <laughs> we have a lot already to work with. The key element though, I think here is that, that one of the things that, that's gonna come out from this and, and, and uh, it's always written in all the approvals that we do, that the CDP has the force and effect of law. And Glenn puts that in there every time. And what's very interesting is Someone could come before us and meet all of the code requirements that are currently structured within the zoning ordinance and yet miserably fail in meeting the, the state, meeting the requirements for the comprehensive development plan because it has what I would call 
the fuzziness for things that people didn't anticipate when the, even if a new code is written where somebody goes, oh, God, I never thought that would be possible. So this really is a very important document from that standpoint. Aside from the explicitness of it to the degree that it's strategic, it's the fuzziness that glues it all together. Um, that's the part I think is, is so valuable. To this. It is a land use plan. And we, I don't want to lose sight of that. It's a land use plan. Uh, but it has a big impact, ultimately. It does have the force and effect of law, and I, 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 I always bring this up, and Glenn has to remind me, but I think it's only happened two or three or four times in the state of Delaware where that ended up being used as the determinant for a legal decision that went beyond the code enforcement. Can you give an example? Um, so there was a, <clears throat> there was a case, it, it, it's actually the converse of, yeah, they ruled against it, I think. Yeah. Right, so, well, so there was a case in Kent County where the CDP said that um, property in a certain zoning district would be um, zoned so that the density would increase. You, get, you could build more housing units than what the current zoning allowed that was on the code book. So the CDP said, we're going to increase the density of this particular zoning district. The... Um, jurisdiction, Kent County, didn't ever implement the ordinance change to actually change the zoning to allow for the higher density. And under state law, you have to do that within 18 months of the certification of the plan. They didn't do it. The developer applied for a permit to construct at the density that the CDP anticipated, but was not consistent with what the code currently said. And in that case, the court said, when you put this in your comprehensive development plan, you effectively changed, changed the zoning in that zoning district, and that developer was then allowed to develop at that increased density because the CDP has the force of law and it anticipated that increased density, even though the code book didn't yet catch up to the CDP. Well, that's consistent, though, with superseding in terms of legislation. Right. Right. Usually it's the latest piece that, that governs when there's a conflict between Right. The, the only difference here is that, is that the, the CDP, you know, people look at it oftentimes as a land planning guide, but it, when you say force of law, it means something. It a has, statute. It, it is, Basically. for all intents and purposes, right. a statute. But, but then you get into the fuzziness of it that sometimes becomes difficult to determine, okay, it's statutory, but, you know, so. And, and interestingly, the, I, I think I've mentioned this before here, the a municipal CDP, the entire document has the force of law, the text and the maps, the state law makes a distinction between municipal and county CDPs. County CDPs in the state law, it only says the maps have the force of law. So, you know, they can use some some of the more fuzzy language in the text and yeah, but in the in the municipals it says the text and the maps have the force of law. The interesting part about Rehoboth is a lot of majority of municipalities that have a lot of vacant land still to develop, they look at the future land use map and the annexation map. Right. And they try to skip the wording because they want it to be general enough. So there's two maps that are looked at every day by the planning administrator to make sure they follow it. However, this round of comprehensive plans that's different and unique from the other ones is what has to be put in them has changed. The checklist got updated in 2005. So the checklist and requirements of population over 5,000 is more stringent. You have to have policies and goals and um, implementation and strategies. So now the text is being paid attention to because you're forced to put it in a document that has to match the map. So this whole entire document, when you get a site plan after you get your comprehensive plan, if the staff is not doing it, the planning commission will need to do it to look at it to say, does it meet our intent of the comprehensive plan? So it's another checklist for a site plan to come through. And you will have housekeeping for your zoning and everything that'll be happening in 18 months. So it won't be conducive. Um, so it's another document that legally has to be followed. Yeah, I'll keep the ball rolling and take on housing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, great. Okay. Rick. Um, I'll take whatever you want me to give me, but I think the three that I would be most effective in are economic development, housing, and infrastructure. And I have no problem with uh, having a co-chair. I'll do housing with you if you want to do that. I'll do that, or I would, is that what you want me to do? I'll, I'll just, if you, you, can if go you don't mind taking housing, I'll take economic development. All right. I'd say okay. your environment or economic development. Well, Rachel, you want to do <clears throat> economic development? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a biggie. That's, that's a biggie. I'm and happy to have help. Do you have... Do you want to do environment? Oh, actually, oh, Joyce. sorry. Joyce. Joyce. Oh, 
Okay, but then Joyce. Sidebar, she said she'd be my co partner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On economic development. Okay. I mean, we, if we can have three. If we can have three. There's a lot that. there. Well, I need environmental is going to be a big one, and quality of life, I still have. Barry open. said environment. If I yeah, have right. yes, he did. What is it? Environment. Environment. Okay. We have some great resources there to help. Okay, and so then we have Lee on housing. I'll do that with him if he wants. With and Stephen? You and I are going to stay off these. <laughs> I think you're going to, if you're asking my opinion, I'd like you to be, because you're going to be the funnel to me, so you're going to be busy with all five. How about Mark? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll call Mark and, and see uh, where he would. Uh, Connectivity is another like good that. one that could use a partner, probably. So yeah, connectivity probably could use a partner. I mean, so Mike, how do you feel about that? I'll, I'll do housing with Lee, but I'll also do economic development if you want me to join you. So, okay. If we, I think what'll be, if you can get one at least per group, that will help us assign more tasks if we have two. So yeah. if we can stick to it, like two per type, there's gonna be enough tasks that we can help. We can actually yeah, delegate. I, I, I think probably two per topic makes the most sense. I'm a little worried about going to three leaders that we might- We're trying our meetings with that. Gonna be like herding cats uh, just to get a time to have conference calls or whatever. Um, I mean, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I'm just trying to think what's gonna be easiest for everybody. Well, and remember that we're gonna have five in that room. So, so that'll be the three of us. So you want each of us to take, be on two committees or two two topics? Well, I think that two would be leaders. good. I, I didn't hear anybody volunteer. Well, I'll do quality, quality of life of then. You do quality of life, okay? Yeah, that was seemed to be missing. And then the missing person gets elected. Whatever you're going to talk to him about. Okay. So Mark, we have. I mean, so did you want to talk to Mark? Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. talk to Mark. Um, if, and if you want so some shifting around, just come hmm? back to me. If you want some shifting around after you talk to Mark. Well, no. Well, I'm. It's fine. There's, there's still plenty of room for him to fit okay. in here. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I, I, right now what I have is uh, Rachel and Joyce for economic development. Um, I have Barry for quality of life. Um, I also have Barry for the environment. Um, How did you get yeah. on the and, screen? Oh, I was oh. Oh. I, reinforcements. I well, typed fast this time. You're faster Sorry. than mine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was going to say that. Well, there, there we have it. So, you know, we'll, we'll fill in and see if, uh, if Mark wants to co-chair, uh, you know, environment, connectivity, or quality of life. Uh, and... Uh, but Mike, the... It's, who was infrastructure? Didn't you do somebody? Yeah, I volunteered. Oh, I, I, is infrastructure... Oh, so I was just clarifying. So when you're asking if you need more members, I, would, I wouldn't recommend more than two because you're forgetting about the other three members you have as your leaders. Jeff, Rick, myself, and then staff. So your team is not going to be less than six. You're the lead, but it's not going to be less than six of us in there brainstorming in the think tank together. So what we're trying to do is have um, my execution with the staff to be able to help with the tasks, the staff, and keep it going, but Jeff and Rick to be the porter. So they can work through you to me, so I'm not getting 12 different responses of everything. So they'll be the portal and the man, the manager of the manager. Is that? Is, is, is infrastructure, I volunteered for infrastructure, but is that a, a topic like the others, or you're treating that separately? Infrastructure, we would like the courtesy to talk to the city management, because there's a, probably more of an education presentation on that versus we didn't get any um, negative thing on, like, the water. There's sewer, there's sewer clarification. but. We want to talk to the city about the approach. Is that a presentation and an update with data, or are people concerned because they don't know? Because there's the only reason I, I spent nine months working on infrastructure. Streets, connectivity. On, mm -hmm. water, yep. on the water and, and sewer. Um, but there's another aspect, uh, uh, there's several aspects to infrastructure, but one of the others that's, that's happening very quickly um, is in telecommunications. Right there. And the city is, city's dealing with, um, right. which I happen to have a background in. And so, yep. so I was. I'd, so I'd this, still like to be involved in that piece if possible. So we're just finding out, um, we wanted the courtesy to talk because this is more department head driven and what they're doing and what people do not know that's being done. So rather than turn into a what's, what people are maybe complaining about, it's an education of 
what do we have for water? So in the comprehensive plan, the things I need to know is by law, what do we have for water capacity? What do we have for future growth? Are the rate studies been done? What initiatives have been done? That's what I have to meet for, for redevelopment, development, and new development to happen. On top of that, we thought we'd go into there is an asset management plan, there's a water facilities plan, there's a wastewater facilities plan that are standalone plans that should not be anything but a reference in this document. So we would like to meet with Sharon and with um, um, Kevin to go over the approach they wanna take on this. Do we wanna have this in a forum where they present and talk about all the infrastructures? Do we wanna have this as a uh, forum in the public where we have the tables set up? We just don't wanna speak on behalf of all our department heads. Okay. Yep, I, I definitely. Yep. I just have a, a personal concern because it is, um, the FCC issued a report and order uh, yep. mm -hmm. with regard to um, facilities, and it, it, they designated uh, cell phone providers mm -hmm. uh, as essential facilities. And basically, uh, the result of that federal change uh, has allowed it to ride roughshod uh, over just about anything you have yep. uh, in terms of zoning and requirements. Uh, and they've set in place uh, what they call shot clocks, mm -hmm. uh, which it occur at far faster ways yep. than, than various committees meet. Um, and I, I just have a personal, uh, I have a big concern about it because we're in a difficult situation. And you that. hired a firm to come in on that. You have a new ordinance on that within the um, city of Rehoboth Beach within the last year. So they've addressed that new regulation and prompted what can be regulated or not. So that's one of the things we wanted to bring in as well as trends in um, providers, especially at coastal communities where they're doing small cell on the boardwalk mm -hmm. and light for... Um, so there's a lot of, there's, you're right, services provided by others. But as far as regulatory, we probably want to find out what they did in this last ordinance with the Pennsylvania group. But this was one we felt we needed to talk to the city manager and say, we can't speak on behalf of your department heads and your staff, and that's where all this comes from. So we wanted the input before we determined it as another workshop setting. Okay. But Very definitely guy. not, definitely advantageous for everybody to know. I have a strong interest in infrastructure as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. So we just need to find out where we're at, what data we have, because I think the thing I'm more excited about the workshops is how much you're going to learn about the city that hasn't that you haven't had an opportunity for. You do site plan processing and put out fires and review plans, but have you had the uh, this board itself? Not everybody on this board has had the opportunity to find out. Do you know how many rentals there are? Do you know um, what the water capacity is? Is there an issue? Do you know if we have sewer capacity for growth? So you will learn at these workshops, just like the rest of us, to include this data in there. So I think it's a great opportunity for when you form your codes and decisions and goals. So, so the infrastructure just on hold until we have a courtesy discussion. I think one thing I would, I would along Stephen's comments, we don't necessarily need a workshop, but I think it might be beneficial. Uh, I don't know if I want to. It might be beneficial to understand and listen uh, to the various department heads Absolutely. on these topics as a member of the planning board, yep. not with any uh, desire to create a workshop for it, right. but it, it's just more additional input to do the right thing. So that might work well. Too. That's what Rick said. Yeah, that's what Rick said. We've yeah. we've met with them. Part of our scope is to be the liaison with the department managers, so they aren't coming in and having questions answered without giving you the factual data first. So we're collecting data. Um, we just got done reading the asset management plan. That's 456 pages. So that tells where the problems are, how old the pipes are, what has to be what year it's right. going to hit the fan. Um, same thing with the water. They're doing a stormwater assessment they just got funding for. So we're taking all of these initiatives and their plans and trying to, as we alluded to a little bit with Rick, trying to get the highlight version of that. In a, that has to be in the document. So we're pulling the data, starting to write a little bit. I think a good approach might be a cliff note version of the highlights or areas of concern presentation on all infrastructure, sewer, streets, water, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot, stormwater is a big one. So we, the next meeting that I've been asked to is two tasks I have is, besides all the other tasks that I have today, is um, to bring up all the data with the resources that we have that we're collecting with the staff, other agencies, and a link if we can get that to you if you're more interested in it. And then the other one is to um, get the workshops, after the February workshops, what kind of timeline are we looking at? Like you wanted to say, what are topics are we doing? And you're going to send this document to us too, right? Yes. The one that you reviewed. Yes. Okay. I want to save this real quick, though. Okay. Well, oh. thank you. Um, I, I think we've made some great progress here, uh, and I particularly appreciate you know uh, the uh, willingness to step up to the plate and and had more volunteers than even expected for these workshops, and I think that's terrific. 
um, and uh, we'll be in touch, uh, Debbie, Jeff, myself, uh, with each of you to see uh, when, a, uh, when the best time is in the next uh, week to 10 days to at least have a, a, a kickoff conversation about uh, you know, coordinating the workshop uh, that you volunteered for. So, Debbie, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank appreciate you, it. Going uh, good. Yeah, yes. Just a quick question. What's the notice period for us to actually <coughs> share this workshop information to the public or before? There's not a requirement because it's a workshop that's not, there's no votes and there's no quorum. Okay. If we have a potential quorum, we always recommend that there's an agenda posted for potential quorum, but there's no formal meeting that's being conducted. Um, however, Should in this case, the sooner the better where we get the flyers out, the notices right. out the website. So as soon, meeting with the leaders in the next two weeks, this has to be rolled out by the end of um, January to be successful. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, moving on to our agenda items. Uh, the next item on the agenda was consideration of impossible action on requirements, considerations, and other matters regarding sketch plan reviews. Um, I put that on as a follow-up lead to, to the issue that you raised at the last meeting. Um, I don't know if we want to discuss that any further at this point, or is that going to be subsumed uh, perhaps into our discussion of changes to the code and uh, what we might want to see as requirements for submission of site plans and things of that nature? Um, yeah, yeah, it sounds like that could be wrapped together. So. Just want to refresh our memory on this. I think the issue was, you know, some of the applications that had come in recently um, were not in conformance necessarily with code. Um, and whether, you know, we needed to address that issue. And um, some of them, you know, had the, the, the applicant had the plan of, obtaining a variance to deal with the issues oh, yeah. that didn't comply with code and you know whether we were in a you know should be in a position of commenting on the variance one way or the other or taking a position on it and it it was just I, I think it it it's brought forth the need to maybe clarify exactly what an application needed to be in order to be heard by the planning commission so I can right. tell you that yeah. that yeah. was heard um, because they just started their budgetary process and they asked for some budgetary numbers to look at the process and what they call pre-qualification, meaning did the applicant meet all the requirements to be able to be heard? And if they met all the requirements, how much, how de how much detail does the staff need to get into a recommending um, comment letter or should that be something that's sent out to a professional to do his review, an engineer, an architect, a planner, et cetera? So I do know that there was a meeting held on to discuss that, but it hasn't, other than budgetary, because you know that process started and doesn't get done until March, April? March. March. So they do have some housekeeping that they have brought up from your last meeting that you heard that at. That's the only reason uh, I know is the budget. Yeah, and, I, and, and I think also uh, part of the issue was, you know, a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Uh, you know, the planning commission, if an applicant runs off first to the board of adjustment and gets variances and then comes in here and presents something to us, uh, what are we supposed to do at that point? Uh, and that makes, <clears throat> you know, the role of the planning commission difficult, uh, to say the least. And, and as I expressed from my personal standpoint, uh, I really would not like to see applicants going off and getting variances because I don't think variances is the way to, to, uh, to run the city uh, all the time. Uh, but, you know, there may be, uh, I just think it's more appropriate uh, to come to the Planning Commission first and let us uh, provide our recommendations and suggestions. So, um, But that, as you say, that gets back into the catch-22 of the right. situation. Do they then come saying, well, we're coming subject to these variances or potential yeah. variances? And Yeah, I, I, that's always a problem. Yeah. Of course, with, with sketch plan reviews, they don't have to be code compliant to come before mm -hmm. us. Uh, but certainly site plan reviews are, are different and, and subdivision plans, but uh, obviously it's something we need to work through and, and it's something to, to look at in the code uh, as that process moves forward. Uh, I think we need to keep it in mind, however. Mm -hmm. uh, the next item 
consideration of impossible vote on adoption of amendments to bylaws and policies and procedures of the Planning Commission. Um, I think it's best if we uh, hold off once again on this until the next meeting. Uh, I personally apologize for sending out the most recent versions at 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> um, as I told Debbie when I saw her, I, I, I think I was going to bed when she was getting up because she gets <laughs> up early in the morning. Um, and uh, just unfortunately, my, my family emergency, medical emergency sort of messed up my, my ability to do things over the holiday period. Rick, uh, so if I could just, yep. since I won't be here on February mm -hmm. 14th, first of all, I want to congratulate you and, and give you uh, some real high praise. I think you did a great job on this. Well, thank you. And um, I only had one comment, and that has to do with the written decision required in the procedures. Um, I would hope that we would come up with a sort of a format which uh, can be developed by the attorney, our, our attorney and uh, with, the, with the chairman and the, and the vice chair and perhaps the city manager, which would have three elements to it. First would be the decision itself and the, uh, the second would be the rationale that supports the decision. That's very important because of its ability to withstand a court challenge. So you have to state your reasons. And then the third would be the conditions that would be applied to that application, including any phasing or whatever, which the applicant would have to meet to implement the, uh, the project. That's generally what happens, at least what I'm aware of, that you would have a written decision and it would have at least those three elements. Yeah, we, I mean, we certainly can work toward that. Um, we do that re routinely in other jurisdictions with Board of Adjustment decisions. Is, um, you know, zone, zoning issues always, they're looking to the record, what was the rationale? Was there um, substantial evidence to support the decision and free of error? I mean, it can't, it can't hurt to write a decision, though, that supports the rationale for your um, uh, voting one way or the other on an application. Uh, I was thinking in terms of a sort of a form that could be used mm -hmm. and just filled in each time that those three parts it would be a lot easier if we could we could do that and it would you know it have it would state the reason for the for the approval or disapproval the rationale uh, with the reasons for example it doesn't meet code or it does meet code or it meets the comprehensive plan and why and then lastly whatever conditions you place on the applicant in terms of implementation. The other way we've done it, um, and this body's done it before on, on larger applications, is through a resolution. You, d you adopt a resolution approving the, the, the project, but it has all those same things in the whereas clauses. Well, it could we be a resolution. It doesn't have right. to be. It, that's what it would be, actually. It's a resolution of the of phasing needs to be a little bit more flexible than in a written document because something financial contribution uh, findings in the field could trigger something to be faster or less than and that sometimes can be done by the city manager administrative power so that's that could be made flexible in in the document and also they have the right to come back and ask for an amendment if they feel it needs they need that okay that's my only comment otherwise I think this is great uh, great work <clears throat> okay. I don't know if anyone else who's had an opportunity to review this has any comments at this point, but uh, if not, if you do have comments before the next meeting, just let me know and I'll try to uh, incorporate them uh, on a more timely basis. Uh, so once once again, uh, this Rick, Rick, I did have one comment. Reasons. Yes. The, um, the change in the bylaws, the, I was confused about the number. Uh, it could be no less than five Right, and no more than nine, but isn't it by code? Do we have to have nine? No, the code. The code is what establishes the range. Well, I, I looked and at that section fifty-one two. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fifty-one two is actually the city code. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry when when you refer to code, I was talking about the state statute. Oh no, I'm talking about what's and, required and in the city. The, the state statute is the is what establishes the range of five to nine. The city code. Says has, nine. has adopted a nine, and you know I understand that the commissioners are have been talking about or are considering whether or not to reduce that number. I mean, but, but can we change? That's, that's can, our, can our bylaws change the city ordinance on that? 
No, the, 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 the code, the, the city code, state code first will control. Right. So long as the city code's consistent with the state code, the city code's going to control. So the city the code now says nine. Right, right. We, as a, right. we cannot say we can have between five and nine. We have to have nine. Bylaws have to. I don't. No, I don't. I, I, think, I, I, I think that the mayor can appoint as many up to nine as he wants. No, it doesn't say it. It says, it, it says there are nine, nine members. Yeah, he's, yeah the, the code says nine. The bylaws say five five to nine and tracks the state statute. I, I guess I assume that we wouldn't have to amend our bylaws if the commissioners decided to amend the code to say it's seven. That, that's right. So, so you, yeah. you provide the range so that if they change the city code, then you're still within your bylaw. Right. I'm not sure that you even need a bylaw that declares how many members are here because your bylaw won't be able to, to change it or drive that. Yeah, it, it's, it's probably superfluous information, but. Um, Who turns that a few years ago? Well, I, 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 th I think, a, I think a few years ago, it was there, reduced. Sure. It was reduced to seven for a short period of time, yeah. and then it was put back at nine. A lot of municipalities are seven. They've gone from nine to seven or seven to five even. Mm -hmm. um, Depends on the population demographics. Well, if, if they did that, it would still not become effective until the terms of the people who were there right. were done. Right, and, and you know, I, I may have in here gone beyond. I don't know, Glenn, you need to tell us, you know, because of the, I've, I've included a provision in the bylaws that says that you know if the commissioners reduce from say nine to seven, you know that the current commissioners serving don't get kicked off just because there's been a reduction in the size until the next round of appointments or reappointments. I'm not sure that whether our um, city code addresses removal. I mean, they... they well, re removal is only for cause. Okay. And that's after a public hearing. All right. They would have the right to do an ordinance that says we're going from 9 to 7 effective what date? Yeah. Effective at the end of the term of the existing planning commission members or effective immediately. That's within the purview of the city commissioners. Right. I, th I think I, it's in there now. I, I think, think I right. read that somewhere. We'll look at all that. We're going to get to yeah. this again in, in another round. So those are good good notes to take, and, and we'll have answers for them. Is that something they're actively considering at the moment? I've heard some discussion. I don't. There's nothing that's been. I'm trying to recall now. I, no, I think there has been. And it, I, I believe there has been, and I indicated to a couple of commissioners that I thought it would be nice if they asked us what our thoughts were. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so moving on, building inspector's report. There's no one here representing the building inspector. City solicitor report. Uh, the only thing I wanted to mention is uh, some time ago you all received a communication from the law firm, the outside law firm that's handling our uh, beach walk case. Um, they're representing the commissioners and you were asked to provide certain documents and so forth. At this point, um, the discovery in the, lit in the litigation, this, the, the taking in of documents, that's all closed. Um, so you should not, whatever you provided, you provided. There's no expectation that you're gonna provide anything further at this point. So you can consider that portion of the litigation to be, you're, you're done with that portion. I assume we still should be preserving whatever we have, however. Always, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just Certainly the, 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 it's not free range, it's hit the delete button. Uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Um, I, uh, as everybody, I've read that Clear Space has bought the property, um, the two or three properties, whatever they are. My understanding is, so I assume they feel pretty certain about being able to build whatever they're building, but my understanding is if there's a change of usage which obviously this is from whatever the little store was to the arts or um, that they have to come to us. Is that correct? If they come in with a what's called a buy right application, meaning that their whatever their use is is permitted under the code um, as as a right, and they're building structures that are compliant with the zoning codes that don't need any sort form of variances, there's. Um, there, there, there is a scenario where they would probably be able to build there without coming before this this body. I thought, uh, we've, we've, I thought that was put in specifically before 
for, the, not, for things like this. If there was a change of usage, which could be if they put a restaurant there, they would have to come before us. Not, not that I'm aware of. Mm -mm. I mean, we. I absolutely will. Sure, okay. sure. Because I've been told that by several people who were on the planning commission. Hmm. Well, if they don't exactly meet code, wouldn't they have to come in for a site plan approval or something? The change of use is usually in the jurisdiction's administrative decision, planning department decision, or city manager if it meets all code compliance. If it meets all the code compliance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there size requirements or something that trigger the? There, there are certain things that trigger a site plan size. review. That's yeah. right. So we, we don't know. I haven't seen anything yet from Clear Space, so I don't know exactly I what they're I anticipating. Would that it, they'll want something that's going to require that. Yeah, very, why very well. Why did they come before? Well, they came before because now what they were proposing two. was. It was of sufficient size to of sufficient require. Size. Yeah. And, and so I, I don't know what they're doing now. I know there's been reports in the press and on next door, you know, that there have been uh, secret communications with officials of the city. I can assure you that I, for one, as chair of the planning commission, haven't talked to anybody about clear space, um, nor do I know anybody in the city who has, to my knowledge anyways, but um, just to be clear about that. So. I, I won't comment. Beyond that, I won't comment any further, so. Uh, but Glenn, Glenn will get back to us uh, with respect to your question, no, Joyce. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you. I'll send you the provision yeah. of the site plan review that there, there's, there, I think there's four or five different things that can trigger a site plan review. I'll send you that so you, so you have it. Yeah. See that as well, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'll, I'll, if you could I'll, just send I'll, it, I'll just send it, send it to, to, all to all everybody. Um, it's in the zoning, right, it's in the zoning code, code online. I just, I just don't have it with me today. Um, Future planning commission meetings, uh, agenda items for the next regular meeting on February 14th. Obviously the CDP uh, will be on the agenda. Anyone else have any other items for that agenda? You're gonna do the bylaws. And the bylaws, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. And you and, have my proxy, by the way. Okay. Um, and, and still, I, I'm, I'm fearful that we're gonna have uh, a flurry of applications coming our way soon. Uh, have you heard any? She's nodding yes. She's nodding yes, <laughs> but she wasn't wow. nodding the other day. Yeah. So right do, do you think we're going to have anything for February at this point? We currently do not have anything, but I'm anticipating that there's a possibility of court issues and also site plan or description. Sketch review. Sketch review. Now, when that comes before you, do, does that take a priority over what we're doing with the, in other words, is Will an application take a priority over the comprehensive development plan? Are you talking about for if in terms of the action by terms the of sketch plan review or site? You plan have a certain time. Usually, you have a certain time frame, yeah. but it's you have to do both jobs. Yeah, you really, which, <laughs> which, have which, longer meetings. Which, which, you do special which, meetings which, which means longer meetings, which yeah. we discussed a couple of meetings ago. That there may come a time when a three to five just isn't going to work because of the number of items we have to cover. We have a nine thirty stop. I understand. <laughs> Yeah, there is a 9.30 stop, and I guess if anyone wants to suggest taking that out, I'd be happy to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so 10.30? That, that's right. I, I, I forgot that Ann um, wants an absolute 9.30 stop. Um, yeah, and, and the, the, the policies and procedures do outline, you know, time periods within which uh, certain matters have to be considered. Um, and let's see. Also, the April 10th meeting or, well, attendance conflicts for the 14th. I know, Steve, you're not gonna be here. Anyone else, hopefully Mark will be healthy by then. April 10th, the Friday before Easter weekend. Yeah, does it, there was some in, you know, some thought that April 10th, we might need to reschedule that meeting. Is that date, uh, the Friday before Easter, problematic for people? The what? Good Friday, oh, Good Friday. Good oh. Friday. Oh, right. <coughs> it's a holiday in the city. Okay, well, then I guess yeah. we're going to have to change that. Um, given, I didn't realize it was a holiday of that type. Holiday, we, for, we holiday for me for different reasons. But, um, can we do it on Thursday or not? Um, what well, does... It's been typically done in the past, either that or it's a Monday afternoon. I wouldn't mind a Thursday. That sounds all right to me. Is Thursday, April 9th all right yeah, with everyone? Fine. I just got to check here.
same time? Yeah, I would think we'd do it at three. And and is this going to be available that day? The room? Okay. Is that okay? It's fine with me. Harry, you okay? It's good. That? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then I guess we'll set the April meeting for April 9th then uh, at 3 o'clock. Uh, and that concludes the business that I have. Any comments from the commissioners? You may have noticed that we added a couple of couple of items here for citizen comments and, and planning commission member comments, uh, just trying to open it up and make our meetings a little more transparent, particularly with the CDP and everything. Um, so if there are no further comments, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, somebody's <laughs> got to make it first. So move. I'll make it. I'll make it. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Adjourned. <laughs> well done. Yeah, you're so good. <laughs>